Welcome to Quality Improvement Principles of Safety for HIT. This is Lecture B. The following unit is presented by Dr. Peter Pronovost, a practicing anesthesiologist and critical care physician, teacher, researcher, and international patient safety leader. Dr. Pronovost is a professor in the Johns Hopkins University and director of the Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality at Johns Hopkins. The Institute focuses on eliminating preventable harm for patients. The objectives are to investigate the fallibility of people and systems, describe the ways that every system is designed to achieve the results it gets, apply the basic principles of safe design, explain the ways that teams make wise decisions with diverse and independent input. Now let's move on to the next idea, and that is you understanding the principles of designing safe systems. And they are standardized work whenever you could. And that is either by eliminating steps if possible, so the mistake cannot even occur, or standardizing work. Second is to create independent checks our checklist for things that are mission critical, things that are really important for you to do. And lastly, learn when things go wrong. You see, in healthcare, we're really, really good at recovering from mistakes, but we're pretty poor at learning. That is actually reducing the risk that future patients will be harmed. To learn, we need to answer four questions. What happened? Why did it happen? What did you do to reduce risk? And most importantly, how do you know that it actually worked? So let me give you an example. We were trying to reduce catheter infections. You may have read about this in my book, Safe Patient Smart Hospitals. There are type of infections that we give patients when they have catheters, typically tubes that go into their neck to deliver medicines or monitor their heart. And what we found is that doctors were supposed to comply with a checklist when they were placing these catheters that required them to cover themselves, to wear a gown, to cover the patient. In essence, they needed about eight pieces of equipment, but that equipment wasn't stored together. We made our docs run around the hospital seeking it. Oftentimes, it wasn't stocked, and predictably, they would go without it sometimes. So we could have just tried, told them to try harder, but we took a systems approach. So what did we do is we got a cart that stored all the equipment that was needed to comply with this checklist. We standardized the procedure, took eight steps down to one, and compliance went up dramatically. You may have seen this in your own life with going to an ATM machine. It's a great example of eliminating steps so errors can't occur. You can see in many of the older ATM machines and perhaps a few of the current ones, you used to put your card in, the machine would keep your card, you'd type in what you want, it would spit out your money, and then it would spit out your card. And many, many people left their cards behind because once we got our money, predictably, we're human, we walk away. And that was a very expensive mistake for banks because they had to go back and correct all the forms and paperwork and not to say very expensive and annoying for consumers. Now, the banks could have put a sign up on the ATM machine that said, oh, be careful, try harder, be more vigilant. But they didn't. They took a systems approach. And what did they do? In most ATM machines now, you can't even make this mistake because your card never leaves your hand. You swipe it. They eliminated the potential for making this mistake by taking that step out. And as a result, the error leaving your card behind went down several hundred times. Great example of how you could just eliminate a step and make care dramatically safer. Okay, let's go into some independent checks. Now, the greatest example of this is a seatbelt. As you all probably know, there's quite good data that buckling your seats results in improved safety for yourself and your passengers. Because without them, we tend to go flying out of cars. But we're human. We get busy. We sometimes forget to do it. So what do most cars have now? An independent check where if you don't buckle your seat once the car is moving, you get either a beep that might get louder, you get a rather annoying voice speaking to you, but some independent check, a reminder to say, hey, buckle your seatbelt, it's important and you forgot. And lo and behold, these things work. I suspect many of you uh, have had this 
beep go off in your cars and have complied and started buckling your, your car seat. Remarkably effective. We haven't applied them as much as we could in healthcare. Now, we can't have these things beeping for everything because it would annoy clinicians and work wouldn't be able to get done. So we have to be judicious about thinking about what's most important. Now, understand these principles of designing safe systems don't just apply to technical work, but they apply to teamwork. And I love this model of communication because it applies to really any kind of communication you do with your family, with your colleagues, uh, with patients at work. And what it says is that the sender of a message encodes some meaning of that. And that might be the words are ambiguous, so they don't have um, a direct clarity about what they do, but the more innuendos, there is almost certainly nonverbal communication, either through tone or eye and facial movements. And that message passes through an environment that in healthcare is often noisy, chaotic, and it goes to a receiver who has to get that message and then decode what the meaning was in what you asked them to do. And that decoding could be corrupted. That is, there can be truly a translation error. The more the wording is vague, the more the receiver is distracted or not paying attention, the noise of their environment. So let me give you an example. If I come home from work and I say to my wife, oh, I had a rough day at work, uh, she immediately decodes that to say, so what you're saying is you want to go take a jog and not give our kids a bath. And she's absolutely spot on. That's what I was saying. But we're familiar with each other. We have that decoding. And so we don't have a translation error. Most people in healthcare don't know each other that well. We're not that familiar. And so with that, we're at enormous risk for decoding errors when we don't standardize and say explicitly what we mean, when the receiver doesn't read back and create an independent check to ensure that they heard what they said. Let me give you an example. When we make rounds in the ICU now, we have a tool called the Daily Goals. The sender says explicitly what's going to happen for every uh, patient in the intensive care unit. The nurse then reads back and confirms that she heard or he heard what the plan was. And then probably about half the times they decoded it as a mistake. They, what they get back to confirm, we then say, no, that's not exactly what I was talking about. What I meant was this. Imagine if you didn't have that read back half of the time, there'd be errors that wouldn't get caught. And so applying these principles of standardizing communication, creating independent checks, and then when you communicate erroneously, learn critically important. Now, this last idea of the science of safety is to, for you to understand the notion that teams make wise decisions with diverse and independent input, diverse and independent input. And what that means is that the more lens you get about a problem, the more input you get from consumers, from patients, from parents, from colleagues, the wiser the decision you're going to make. Now, if you are the decision maker, you ultimately still make the decision. It doesn't compromise your authority, but you will make better decisions when you have a broader and richer view. A great example of this is this jelly bean test that was written about in a book by Jim Zerwicki called The Wisdom of Crowds. In this, and you may have done it at your church or at a fair, there's uh, oftentimes groups of people will be asked to guess how many jelly beans are in a jar, and whoever gets closest typically will win the jelly beans. What researchers have found is something remarkable, that while any individual guess might be off. In groups, say over 30 or 50, a large enough group, the group mean is remarkably close, often within a few jelly beans from what the actual number is. What the idea here is that there's wisdom in this group that on average will get things right. And the more you can tap into that wisdom in designing information systems, the better off you're going to be. We see so many examples where information systems or code comes down from on high with little input from clinicians or diverse or software programmers, and we're poorer for it. 
I have a little metaphor about this. And and as you may know, Hopkins is a big lacrosse school. And in lacrosse or in soccer, if you get a penalty, you play man down. Now, for the women out there, I tried calling it woman down or person down. But many of the women, even women who play lacrosse, say, well, we still call it man down. So um, let's go with the phrase man down. When you're in the penalty box, you're clearly disadvantaged. Indeed, several years ago, Johns Hopkins almost threw away the National Lacrosse Championship to Duke when they got a penalty with a few minutes left and Duke scored several goals when they were man down. Luckily, Hopkins hung on to win the game. But as I watched that, I sat there and thought, why on earth do we voluntarily play man down every day at work and healthcare by not not listening to our patients, by not listening to nurses, by not listening to our colleagues. It's a foolish way to play. We're, we're disadvantaged and we're going to lose. So what you need to do is if you see something or if you, you think there's a risk, speak up. And when others are speaking up, make sure that you're given their due. So what's your role and how do you apply these principles in your work? Well, first, If you accept that you're fallible, assume that things will go wrong. Don't believe no matter how expertise you are in informatics that you're going to program or do your work flawlessly. You will make mistakes, as we all will, so assume things are going to go wrong so you can defend against them. Secondly, develop lenses to see these systems. When when things go wrong, don't just see yourself or that your colleagues and patients think about training, think about teamwork, think about protocols. Third, work to mitigate both the technical and teamwork risks in your environment. Do that by standardizing your work. And that means, for example, limit the number of choices of drugs that people have so you don't have to choose 30 out of a drop-down list. Create independent checks. If something is really, really critical, make sure the information system has a fail-safe to say, oh, this is too important. We have to confirm it's right. And learn from your mistakes. Next is make sure that you apply this knowledge of making wise decisions by getting input from others whenever you make decisions. You don't need to make this work in a vacuum. And lastly, keep patience as your North Star. This work that you're embarking on is really about them and make sure that the way we organize our work isn't geared solely around clinicians. It's not geared around the information technology people. It's geared around patients and their needs. Because at the end of the day, we have to make sure that people like this little girl who died needlessly of a catheter infection that wasn't treated appropriately, no longer suffer these kind of harms. And I'm confident that with your leadership and with this training, you'll be able to do so. I thank you and I hope you enjoy the class. This concludes Principles of Safety for HIT. In summary, in this unit, we've learned about the ways that teams make wise decisions with diverse and independent input. We've also learned about the importance of communication and especially the place of critical listening. 